Sally and Bob Dowler's family grew bigger with the arrival of their second daughter, a girl they named Amanda, on June the 25th, 1988. Later, her family and friends would grow to refer to her lovingly as Millie. A name that just seemed to fit the amazing young girl that she had grown to be. Millie shared a home with her mother and father, Sally and Bob, as well as her older sister, Gemma. Gemma and Millie were close. Growing up, the two sisters shared a bedroom and Gemma recalled how they would sneak treats back from the kitchen and stay up all night talking about boys, giggling and gossiping. Everyone wanted to be around Millie because she was a sweet girl with a contagious energy. If you were so much as acquainted with Millie, chances are that you adored her. However, the family's life was about to be enveloped by a dark, dark cloud. On March the 21st, 2002, at 3.07pm, Millie Dowler and her companion walked from Heathside School in Weybridge, Surrey, to the Weybridge train station. One stop before Dowler's normal stop of Hersham, the girls disembarked at Walton-on-Thames railway station and headed to the station cafe to dine. The girls left the cafe at around 4.05pm with Dowler walking home by herself after she had called her father at 3.47pm to let him know that she would be home in half an hour. Three minutes later, a friend of Gemma, Millie's sister, who was standing at a bus stop, last saw Millie heading down Station Avenue. Further down the road, a closed circuit television camera did not capture any video of Millie. Millie had vanished. At 4.32 p.m., the camera that failed to capture Millie captured a red day in next year as it passed by. At 7 p.m., two hours and 45 minutes after she was expected to return to the family home by her father, Dowler was reported missing to the police. Later in interview, Gemma said she already felt something was very, very wrong. Following the missing persons report, over 100 police officers, police dogs and aircraft searched the farms, streets and rivers near Hersham as part of a nationwide hunt for the 13-year-old schoolgirl. Millie's age and profile made this a very real emergency. To assist in the search, detectives who had looked into Sarah Payne's kidnapping were also called in. No police force wants to fail in finding a missing young girl, especially in a case that has the potential of being high profile. As the search went on, numerous requests for information were made by the police and the Dowler family, including a segment on the BBC's Crime Watch UK, a popular monthly true crime TV show. A direct message to Dowler was included in the Crime Watch UK appeal in the hopes that she had left her house on her own accord. Additionally, Will Young, the Pop Idol winner whose concert Dowler had gone to just before she vanished, too made an appeal. At this time, this was a huge boost to the investigation. Social media was in its infancy and celebrities from mainstream TV had a captive audience and massive influence. But would this be enough to bring Millie home? Her mother hoped that her daughter had fled willingly, but she was unable to come up with an explanation as for why she would desire to do so. Millie, to all intents and purposes, was a happy girl. The police reported a week after Dowler vanished that they believed she was not kidnapped against her will. They reasoned this because despite a number of reported sightings of her before she vanished, no one had come forward to say that they had seen a struggle on Station Avenue and nothing was picked up on CCTV. They reasoned that she was unlikely to have left with someone that she did not know of her own free will. Unknowingly to the police at the time, this was a grave mistake. When a body was discovered in the River Thames on April 23rd, 2002, media reports suggested that the remains could belong to Dowler. 
However, the body was later determined to be that of 73-year-old Maisie Thomas, who had gone missing in March of 2001 and whose demise was not seen to be suspicious. Now, in June 2002, Millie was still missing. Despite additional searches, the National British tabloid The Daily Sun offered a £100,000 reward, as well as the efforts of her parents to contact her by text in the hopes of receiving a response. There was still no sign of a resolution to this case. Police now felt that they had enough evidence that they were confident in informing her parents that she was most likely killed during the first month following her disappearance. In Yately Heath Woods near Yately, Hampshire on September the 18th, 2002, now six months since Millie was last seen, mushroom pickers came upon some naked human remains. Later, the identity of these remains was sadly confirmed to be those of Millie Dowler. A fact that had to be confirmed only by her dental records. The intensity of the decay made it impossible to determine the cause of death. No parts of Dowler's clothing or belongings, including the pocketbook, rucksack and cell phone that she was carrying when she vanished, have ever been located. To think of these items that would have been so important to Millie being destroyed or thrown away as if they were nothing adds to the heartlessness and dehumanisation of this dreadful act. Police now reclassified the case as a homicide investigation after the discovery of Millie's body. The inquiry was carried out by Surrey Police and was known as Operation Ruby. Police set up a roadblock in the area where the body was discovered on November the 22nd, 2002 and 6,000 local drivers were questioned, but no new leads were found. There was still no sign of the Red Day Unaxia from the CCTV that was seen minutes after Millie vanished. The police understand that statistically speaking, family members are likely to be involved in murders of this type. Surrey police initially thought Millie's father, Bob Dowler, was a suspect. However, later they expressed regret for any missed opportunities that possibly may have resulted from their wrongly aimed focus on Bob. The DNA of an identified male was found on a piece of Dowler's clothing on March 23, 2003, indicating that her killer may have previously encountered her. But within three months, this connection was disproved along with an additional DNA connection to the burglary of a church in Sunderland. In the years following Millie's disappearance, her family faced an array of needless and cruel harassment. They received death threats, hoax calls, false leads, and even phone calls from someone impersonating their beloved daughter and sister. Fast forward five years and a new suspect was found. Someone that the police thought capable of committing a crime of such a horrific nature was a man named Levi Belfield. Belfield appeared on the radar of Surrey police following his conviction for the murders of two young female students and the attempted murder of a third. Surrey police announced on February the 25th, 2008 that Levi Belfield was their primary suspect in the murder investigation and that they were extremely interested in questioning him. Belfield was detained in March 2008 over the disposal of a car connected to the murder investigation but was later released. Police investigated Bedfont Lakes Country Park in West London in October 2009 in the hopes of finding the Red Day Unexia that had been connected to Belfield. But they were unable to turn up the vehicle or anything else relevant to their investigation. This vehicle, to this day, is still missing. As the police pieced together evidence against Belfield, he was accused of kidnapping and killing Millie on March the 30th, 2010. 
Belfield was formally charged in connection with the Dowler case on October the 6th, 2010, and he appeared in court via video link. The reason for the video link? Belfield was already serving three life terms for murder and attempted murder at that time. The Central Criminal Court's Mr Justice Wilkie presided over Belfield's trial, which commenced on May the 10th and ended on June the 23rd, 2011. After six painful weeks for the Dowler family, the jury found Belfield guilty. Life in prison. Outside the Old Bailey after the verdict, Millie's mother said, For us, the trial has been a truly awful experience. We have had to hear Millie's name defamed in court. She has been portrayed as an unhappy, depressed young girl. The Millie we knew was a happy, vivacious, fun-loving girl. Our family life has been scrutinised and laid open for everyone to inspect. We've had to lose our right to privacy and sit through day after harrowing day of the trial in order to get a man convicted of this brutal murder. The length the system goes to to protect his human rights seems so unfair compared to what we as a family have had to endure. Please subscribe for more Dark Case documentaries. Thank you.